We've been in a series, except for last Sunday. I took a detour last Sunday, but we've been in a series called Exercising Your Faith. And uh, I was going to end it on this message, but I probably am going to uh, do one more message on exercising your faith. Um, and through giving, through much and giving, and we, we may do that next week, my mind. But uh, uh, four times, let me just pray. We'll just go straight through this. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to be talking about exercising your faith through prayer. Y'all look at me. Maybe we can get this to the point. There is nothing that we can do in our Christian life that is as important as building our relationship with Christ. And the way that we'll do that is in prayer. We all pray. We all pray. But I'm not sure that the, the two things that are the most important we don't take for granted. One of them is prayer. And the other one is sharing our faith. We, we just take it for granted. But it's foundational. It makes all the difference. God is God. He can do whatever He wants to do. He created the world. He's sovereign over all. His hand keeps things from us. His hand blesses things. He takes care of our forever so that we won't have to be lost if we come to know Him. And I could not in any way, shape, form, or fashion put limits on God. Only person who can put limits on God is God. And if God so chooses to only work through the prayers of His people, we should be awakened to that. If God so chooses to hear our prayer and the God of all eternity joins our prayer and creates life on this world, love, joy, and protection, then we need to understand that that is highly important for people who call themselves followers of Christ. And we need to exercise the faith that we have in prayer. Let's pray. Now, Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you for uh, uh, allowing what you allowed, sovereign God. I thank you for the circumstances, though it was difficult for them to walk through. For Peter and how he uh, approached those circumstances, for the church and how they approach those circumstances. And Father, I pray that we learn today from You, Holy Spirit, Almighty God, Jesus our Savior, how we can face the same difficult circumstances of life, but face it well through You working in us, with us, and through us. Jesus, speak. Shout, whisper, Thy will be done on earth in the same way, in the same matter, and to the same extent that it's done in heaven. We, Lord, we uh, vanquish our minds in action. So, Lord, that for the next few moments we can be with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts chapter verse 1, it says, Now about that. Herod the king, this is Herod um, Antipas, uh, he was the great, he was the grandson of Herod the Great, uh, he was, uh, his uh, uncle was Herod as well, his uncle actually married his sister Herodias, and he, he is, now he's in line and he becomes Herod for about seven years, and he was doing something here simply for the fact that he wanted to be, he wanted people to like him, he wanted people to follow him. He really had no regard for the people other than what they could do for him and his kingdom. So it says that he stretched out his hand to from the church. He knew that would make him popular with the Jews. 
Verse 2, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is the James of the inner three of twelve disciples. Peter, James, and John. James and John were called the sons of thunder. They were fishermen. They probably had a temper. They were probably mean old scoundrels with an opinion, and they were probably harsh kind of guys. But God changed them and made them great men. James was the first martyr of the 12 disciples of the inner three where everybody looked up to. His brother, John, was the last to be killed. They couldn't, they couldn't even kill old John. They tried every way they knew to kill John, and they couldn't kill him, so they just put him up out on the uh, Isle of Patmos just to be there by himself and, and, and die of old age if that's the way God wanted it to be done. Now, when this happened, probably in the very presence of Herod, someone took a sword and just went straight through. It made shockwaves in the church. And all the, this, this budding young church wondered, is this what will happen to us if we can f- continue to follow Christ? They killed Jesus, but Christianity came. Now they thought if we can kill the leaders, we'll stop Christianity in its its fresh footsteps. We'll, We'll stop it now. Verse number three. Because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Just remember... This was a big feast. Everybody's there. The anniversary of when Jesus was crucified. And Peter is taken, thrown in jail, and everybody's wondering what's going to happen now. Verse 4. So when he had arrested him, Herod put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Four squads of four people, 16 people to hold Peter there in prison. In the inner prison, there would be uh, four in the prison with him, one chained on his left hand, one chained on his right hand, and two with spears in the prison with him. Outside of that inner prison, there would be two at the door, guarding the inner prison, two that would roam around and guard the other door. You could not get into the the second prison without those people letting you in. Outside of that, there were two guarding the door and two that kept people from the prison into the outer gate. And then there were outside that, two that were guarding the door and two that were uh, outside outside, um, grounds before you could be let out into open public. Sixteen people were there to guard Peter. Remember, Peter already broke out of jail once in Acts 5. They're saying, well, he's not going to do that again. They thought if they got enough people in there and numbered them up that they could, they could hem him in. And God allowed it. Hold on. God allowed it. He would understand this happening, but God allowed it. A lot of things that happen in life when we ask questions of why, things that if we were God, things probably would be differently, but understand God allows things to happen. God allows relationships to come. God allows difficulty to come. And God's the kind of God They can make good things out of bad. Why is it that the children of Israel spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt? Why was it that they were taken captive to Babylon and enslaved again to Assyria, to the northern kingdom? Why? God allowed. Evil is out there in the world. But praise God, there's good too. If there was no evil... Why would we choose to do good? 
God is a God who wants a relationship with us. But he wants us to choose him because we don't want to follow the evil. We want a relationship with someone who loves us, who knows what love is, who can bring, come on, listen, peace, joy, goodness, all those things, kindness, who can bring blessings to our life. God who wants to do so much wants to know us in a personal way. Look what it says in verse number 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant prayer. Church, did y'all catch that? Constant prayer. This word is actually a medical term. It means the stretching of a muscle to its furthest limit. You see, our faith, we're to exercise our faith in God. If we, most of us, want to live our life, walk our life without having to trust on anybody or anything, and that includes God, as long as things are okay, we're okay. We would prefer to live a life where we didn't have to depend on, have faith in anybody else. You ever heard anybody say that? I'm just going to take care of that myself. What are you going to do when you get yourself in a situation where you can't take care of it yourself? What are you going to do when you need someone else? What are you going to do when there's no one here on earth to help and you need a God moment at a God time in your life? Your faith, you will either exercise your faith. Come on, listen. You will stretch it to its limits or you'll hold it close and it will atrophy and die. Use it or lose it. We can exercise and become strong and useful and helpful for us and for those that we love around us. Or we say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk this way. I don't want to do all that. That might, that might push me. I would be uncomfortable. I can't do those things. In the first century church, they got pressure. They got pushed like we've never been pushed before. And here's the thing about it. Instead of running from it, they ran to it. Instead of trying to make it easier, they let God stretch them to places that they never would have been otherwise. Constant prayer was lifted up to God by Who's the church? Y'all raise your hands. All the rest of you come to the altar right now. We need to get things right. It's us, folks. We are the body of Christ. I haven't seen the physical Christ. I haven't heard his audible voice. But I felt his spirit. He's called me to himself. He saved me to the uttermost. And changed my life now belongs to him, and my life is here to serve him. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when, I will do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever, because that's what Christ has done for me. Constant prayer. The church was doing something. They were praying. They were praying. Well, verse six, when Herod was about to bring him out of the night. That night, Peter was sleeping. How many of y'all would be sleeping on the anniversary of the cross? How many of you would be sleeping in an inner chamber, uh, chained to this guy on on your left hand, chained to this guy on your right hand, two guys holding spears, knowing that tomorrow you were to be judged? Your, your, Your friend just got killed with the sword. What do you think's coming? Would anybody be anxious? 
How many of us would have been, how many of us would have been spending the night in prayer? What's Peter doing? Hey guys, you got a pillow? I kind of want to take a nap. Maybe they his outer cloak, they wrapped it up and he just leaned back and I, I, I think it's funny here that the soldiers were there to, to guard him and he's just in there snoring. Boy, he, he's a dangerous one, isn't he? He just sleeping it off. But how many of us like to help God out? How many of y'all have the stomach gymnastics? How many of you just fret? How many of you play those, how many of you go to bed at night and all those things just kind of rumble through your mind over and over and over and over? I got a, I got a, I got something I can do to help you there. If that's what happens to you, just get one of my cassette tapes and stick it in there or one of my CDs. It'll put you to sleep like that. <laughs> Lynn's downstairs working with the kids. We were married uh, less than six months and, and I was trying to hear one of my sermons, and back then they were cassette tapes, and I, I stuck the cassette tape in, and I, I turned it on preaching, and I got through this, looked over at Lynn, and she was asleep. For 35 years, I've been kidding her about that. Well, Peter's down there, he's sleeping, and he, and he says that he was back to change between two soldiers, and the guards before the doors were keeping the prison, that verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and Light shone in the prison. The very glory of God is coming in here. I don't have time to get into all this, but aren't you grateful that God has angels that minister to us as well? At just the right time to do just what He wants you to do. And everywhere they go, the glory of God is with them. That's what we need today. Just give us more of the glory of God. And it said, And He struck Peter on the side and raised him, and raised him up, saying, Rise quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. He didn't say arise quickly because we got to get out of here in a hurry. He said, hey, wake up. Get up. Come on. Get up. Every time we need to do obedience, we need to do it quickly. Let me tell you, there's a lot of things that we as Christians say that we're going to do one day. We're going to procrastinate and say, one day, one day. I remember as a kid, I used to say, you know, one day I'm going to teach Sunday school. One day. One day, I'm going to do everything that the church wants me to do. One day. Brother Broadus, I even said, one day I'm going to be a deacon. Never was. I'll do whatever the church wants me to do. I never said one day I'll be a preacher. But one day. But you know what I figured out? This is the day that the Lord has made. Today's the day we're supposed to rejoice and be, be glad in it. Today's the day where you serve. You only serve God in the right now. You can only be obedient in the right now. We pray, yes. And some of our prayers happen right now. Some of them are time delayed. But our, our, our obedience is never time delayed. Our obedience is always now. If we think we're going to be okay, I can be, I'll be obedient one day, that day may never come. Verse 8, the angel said to him, gird, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garments and follow me. I didn't just say, oh, Peter. You mean I got, all right. Now, these it doesn't tell us if the, if the guards are awake or asleep or in a trance. It doesn't tell us anything. It just says that he's just getting up, he's getting dressed, and he follows the angel, and the door opens, and he walks through. And the door opens, and he walks through. And the door opens, and he walks through. And the great big gate opens. Look what it says. So he went out and followed him, verse 9, did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they 
were past the first and the second guard post. They came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hands of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary. He's walking through thinking he's in a trance. Oh, this is a pretty good dream. I'm just walking through here. He gets out. And they're just still walking, and they turn and go down the street. And maybe Pete went over, looked over at him to say, you know, this is a pretty cool thing. And all of a sudden, he's gone. And he's got, wow. Thank you, Lord. All right, then. What do I do now? Who's going to think that they're over at Mary's house? Let's go over. The name of John Mark. Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. That's the house that they went to. Look what it says. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together. What's the word? He wants to go to a prayer meeting. I'll go there with them. What were they doing? Church, what were they doing? <coughs> what were they doing, church? Praying. praying. Earnestly praying. Fervently praying. Lord, releasing. Lord, I don't understand why, but Herod killed James. Don't let him do that to Peter. Oh, Lord, may your presence be there. May your power be there. May your glory be there. Deliver him, oh, Lord. Verse 13, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. They're inside praying for Peter to get released. He rings the doorbell. I'll go get it. Hey, it's Pete. Who? It's Peter. Peter? Yes, it's Peter. He runs back inside and says, you won't believe who's at the door. Who? Peter. It would have been a good thing if she opened the door and Peter could have came in. She's excited. She's been to a prayer meeting where they're praying that God will release Peter. And guess what? God released Peter. Amen. Amen. Oh, hold on. <clears throat> Verse number 15. They said to her, you're beside yourself. That's the new King James. Brian's vernacular is, you're crazy. What do you mean he's out there? She kept insisting that it was so. No, I'm telling you, it's Peter. It, Peter's out there. Oh, you've been, you've been sipping the ceremonial wine. What's wrong with you, girl? Act, Peter can't be out there. Peter's in prison. So they said, well, it's his angel. Now, here's a little nuance you need to understand. They actually believed that that when a person died, his personal guardian angel would be around to take care of him uh, as he was until he was buried and taken on. So they said, well, Peter's dead then. You, you just saw his angel out there. Isn't it funny that when we go through circumstances, we'll believe the craziest junk in the world rather than believing the simple truth? Well... Peter continued knocking. Can I get a help? Is there a friend in there anywhere? Send somebody. Don't send Rhoda. Send somebody. 
And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I love this word. It means a jaw-dropping moment. Wow! Now, they were in there praying for what? God's will to be done for the release from prison. Now they're actually seeing it. What do you think happened in their heart? I think they were encouraged. I think that they were just like, this really works. This prayer thing, praise God, it works. God heard our prayers. Have y'all ever had those moments where you look back on it and you said, God heard that prayer and answered? What a glorious day. Amen. To think that you were there, that you had the ear of God. He's simply a whisper away. You whisper to Him, He hears it. Oh, come on. He hears every word of it. You have His heart. You have His hand. His love is there for His will to be done. Angel, and there, set old Pete free. Wake him up. Now he'll be sleeping. I, I think that's a good thing because I remember when Jesus was in the boat in the midst of the storm and Jesus was asleep on the front of the boat. Y'all remember that? And, and they came and they woke him up and said, Jesus, the storm, don't you care that we're about to perish? And Jesus said, Peace, be still. And the wind stopped, and the waves stopped, and then Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith. I think when the angel woke him up, he may have even said to old Peter, great by faithfulness. Because you're trusting in God no matter what. You know God can come through. But it says, Peter, verse 17, motioned them with his hands to keep silent. They were talking so much he couldn't even get a word in. And he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James. Now that's the, the other James of the disciples of Peter, James, and John. He's dead now. He got killed by Herod. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who literally became the, kind of the head of the hub of the believers in Jerusalem. He wasn't even a believer until he met Christ in the resurrected form. But now he's a leader in the church. He says, he says, go and tell these things to James and to the brethren. And Peter leaves and goes to another place. Now, the thing about this story that gets me is that they're praying, right? That constant prayer. The muscle is being stretched to its limits fervently, earnestly praying. Y'all listen to me, church. But were they believing? There's a lot that we do in prayer. You know why? Because we're supposed to. But do we really believe God's going to act upon it? Do we really believe that we have the ear of God do we really believe that God is not only going to hear, but God's going to be involved in that? That God wants to hear our prayers. That God wants to act upon our prayers. That God wants to use us as part of His work. We are invited into the work of God through prayer. They knew a lot about him, but they didn't know him. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that know about God. And they're satisfied with the amount of God that they know. They're satisfied that they're going to heaven one day. There's a lot of things that need to happen on earth for the Lord. Maybe he'll find somebody he can use, but... We're satisfied with the life that we have. You know, I think coming through this, they would have looked at it and said, you know, God cares. 
they would have been excited. And I think the next time they got on their knees to pray, they would have said, God, I know you can. I know you care. Lord, help me to pray. Let me give you a word from Jesus. It's in the bark, book of Mark. It's in chapter number 11, verse number 22. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Faith. Though you don't understand it, though you can't see it, you know it's true. Where's your faith? Where's the evidence that what you believe is true? For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, this obstacle, this, this thing that cannot be moved, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Are you listening to me, church? He who sees the mountain and says, be removed and cast into the sea, but does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, you know what he's saying here? He said, I don't care what the obstacle is. If you come to me, I'm bigger than the obstacle. If you believe, if you join with me, there's not one thing that we can't do together. My will, your prayers, God's will be done. Do y'all believe that? Sometimes I hear the prayer request. You know, we care a lot about how healthy people are when they go to heaven or how healthy they are when they go to hell. I hear the prayer request and I don't see a lot of burdens. Uh, it's kind of like, a, oh, by the way, you know, the difference between earnest prayer and casual prayer, casual prayer if it's your prayer request. Earnest prayer is when it's my prayer request. Isn't it funny how you can be praying for old bro Brother Billy and you say, Lord, bless Brother Billy, help him out. <sighs> um, help him with that ingrown toenail. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now I go to sleep. But if it's me, Lord, 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 don't you, will you? Praise God for prayers. The old preachers used to say when somebody would pray through, that, that, that meant they were going to pray until they found the peace on the other side. You don't stop praying until you find the hand of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God. And when you found that peace, then you can get up because God's going to answer. Pray through. But when you pray, believe. Believe. Now, I love this last part of it. I'm going to close here in just a second. This last part of it, he says, but, but if, if there's anybody that has harmed you in any way, make sure that you forgive them. Why do you think that's there? It's obedience. I believe God can bless you. I believe God can answer that prayer. I believe God can do great things. But I... I've been hurt by somebody and I don't want to forgive them. I've got enough in me to believe that God can answer prayer, <clears throat> but I don't have enough faith in me to be obedient to forgive. Let me just ask you, do you believe? Yesterday, 
I did a prayer check. Now, I was supposed to preach this last Sunday, but yesterday I was looking over this, and yesterday morning, <clears throat> me and the dog were out having a walk. And, uh, well, I was walking. He was going here, there, yonder. He was just... And I said, Lord, I've been hurt a lot. Gone through a lot of things. Is there anything I need to forgive? But God is my witness. I kept waiting for him to bring a name to my mind. He never did. As far as I know, I'm good with everybody. As far as I know, I've done dealt with all those things in my heart. Matter of fact, I, things still happen. But I got it on ready alert. I want to forgive as quickly as possible. Because I want my heart to be clean. You know what I finally figured out between me and the Lord? You know the only person I'm really having a problem forgiving is Brian. But yet, hold on. I'm not supposed to hold myself to a higher standard than I hold anybody else. And if I forgive you, and I know God will bless that, why can't I forgive me and walk in cleanness? See, I think God wants to free people up. If you've got a grudge with somebody, you're hurting yourself. Let it go. And if you do, something amazing is going to begin to happen in your life. The power of God will be coming into your life. The Bible says, I'm not even supposed to pray about something if I'm mad at my wife. I'm supposed to go get it straightened out with my wife so that it won't hinder my prayers. Me and Lynn are good. Praise God, hallelujah, and amen. For right now, she might get mad at me and keep me on the way out of church, but I, I, I'm good. I love her with all my heart. She keeps acting like she loves me with all her heart. That's a miracle. And there's something freeing about, come on, if you don't hear anything else, there's something freeing about walking in intimacy with Christ. Hearing, speaking, obeying, believing. Oh, what God can do. I wonder if we're just one miracle away from the greatest revival that this place has ever seen. I wonder if we're just one miracle away. And I'm wondering who's going to be the one that's obedient that God wants to do that miracle in. Do you believe? Are you saying, preacher, that sounds kind of crazy. No, I just simply believe God wants to know how much we believe. What gets me is we believe he can get us to heaven. We just don't know if he could use us here on earth. Stretch your faith. Exercise your faith in prayer and oh what God can do.